Hello and welcome back to my channel. My name is Astri and I'm an illustrator and concept artist working in the video game industry. And today I wanted to talk you through the process behind my recent painting, which is titled Mother. It's a painting of Sonia, who's one of the characters from my personal IP. It's this project I'm building called Runic. I made a whole trailer for it and then also a making of the trailer video on YouTube a few weeks ago. So I'll put a link for that somewhere on the screen if you haven't checked it out yet. So going into this process, I was looking to create a pretty somber painting depicting a little bit of Sonia's backstory, which without spoiling it all and, and going into all the details involves a very special sword that she forges. So I wanted to create a painting of her with the sword kind of in the aftermath after finishing her creation. And I also wanted it to be pretty close cut to kind of focus on the emotion and also to not create a bunch of work for myself. So I had this idea that I wanted her to be holding the sword in a peaceful and almost nurturing way. The opposite of how you would normally hold the sword. But I wasn't sure exactly how I would do it. So as you do, I went to Pinterest and I started looking around for a good reference. So eventually I found this lovely picture and I'll put a link to the photographer in the description if you want to go check out their work and support them. And it ticked a lot of boxes. And so not looking to copy it directly, but instead using it as an informed starting point, I got to sketching. Something about the pose was bugging me though. The arms looked really small because of the perspective and I felt like it just needed some more emotion. I kept searching and I couldn't find any better references online though. So I figured it was time to take things into my own hands. I went to grab my Narsil replica and side note, every artist needs a sword collection for research purposes, obviously. I took some pictures of myself that ended up working a bit better as a base point. My photography will not be winning any awards, it's literally the selfie camera on my phone propped up against the book. But the pose works and the anatomy works, which is the most important part for a reference like this that I'm just going to be using for the sketch. While I'm not a believer in super tight line work when it's not needed, I did make sure that my rough sketch was accurate and wouldn't leave me editing things too much later on in the process. Again, because I had this reference that was pretty much one-to-one -one what I wanted to do, I could just kind of copy the anatomy off of that and that ensured that I wouldn't be running into any major trouble later on. With the rough sketch done, I could move into figuring out the color palette. This one was a bit tricky. I wanted a dull, cold and grey palette, but I obviously didn't want it looking flat or boring either, which is very easy to do with a palette like this. Eventually, after messing around with hue saturation sliders and playing with some hard light and color dodge layers to figure out the lighting, I got to a nice place with it. It still felt like it might be a bit too dull though, so I was considering adding some orange sparks or red lighting for a bit of color contrast, but instead I opted for a more subtle and monochromatic approach, getting some of that much needed contrast through hue variation instead, which I'll talk a bit more about later. After adding some quick dimension and structure to the base color, mainly just using some big soft brushes to get some shadow and volume in there, I went in on top of the sketch and started carving out forms. I wanted this painting to have a textured and painterly look, so I'm using brushes that have more of a traditional feel to them. I always end up defaulting to just like the same three brushes for every painting, but I've been trying to challenge myself to actually use all the brushes I have because I have like a hundred of them and they're all great but I'm just a creature of habit so I reach for the ones I use the most. I think you can discover some really interesting and unique texture though when you actually do try out all these different brushes and I had a lot of fun playing around with them and getting to know the brush set. So I think all of the brushes I used for this painting are from Yuming's brush set, which you can find on Gumroad. I'm pretty sure that's where I got it. I will try to find the link for it and put that in the description as well if you want to try them out. They're super fun. There's a lot of really great, more traditional stuff in there if you want to try your hand at that. So using more noisy brushes is a really good way to increase the fidelity of your painting without needing to spend like 20 hours rendering tiny details. It makes it a lot easier to imply detail rather than literally paint everything in. So for example, there are some fine lines and speckles on her face thanks to the brushes I used, meaning that the skin won't end up looking kind of plasticky and artificial. You know that look that you can get sometimes from digital art if you're, if you're using brushes that are too soft? I avoid that look without having to kind of intentionally paint in pores and intentionally paint in imperfections. 
And this goes for the armor and the sword as well. Using a bristle brush, I think it's literally called bristle if you want to try it out, I was able to quickly get a lot of metallic texture and life into the metals. I find that this type of process leaves a lot more room for expressive edges and I also think it just makes painting a lot more enjoyable because you can be looser and you can, you can play around with it a lot more. So I kept playing around with these brushes pretty much throughout the entire process. You'll see them come in more, especially as I render. But at this point, the painting was still a little bit soft and I also was starting to feel like the composition was a bit unbalanced. It felt like there wasn't enough value contrast, even with the lighting I had added in. To rectify this and also to make her outfit a bit more appropriate for the cold weather, I added a fur cloak around her shoulders to frame her head. And again, I was using the bristle brush and this made this process incredibly quick. There's no need to paint in every single hair, just implying it's there is enough and then the brush will do most of the work for you. Once I was confident in the base painting, meaning the composition felt harmonious, the color palette felt interesting, and the general lighting and mood was in place, it was time to go in and polish everything. So if you know my art at all, you would know that I like to have a pretty rendered look to my paintings, while also keeping some key areas looser to allow for some imagination and also to lead the eye to where it needs to go on the page. So what that means is a bulk of the hours for any painting I do will be spent polishing. Polishing does not mean just sharpening up details though. There's a lot that goes into the step and it's not just fidelity. My general checklist of things to work on usually looks something like this. Number one, the form. This is number one because it is the most important thing on this list. If you don't get this step right, anything else you do on top of it won't make your life any easier. So what I mean by the form is that things look like they have volume. Meaning that your painting doesn't just look like a 2D plane with some lines on it, it actually looks like it could be 3D, that it's a real scene you're looking in on, it has depth, it has volume, it has form. If you want to go for a flatter style because you're doing something that's stylized and more cartoony and just like a whole different style entirely, that's totally fine, obviously. But if you're going for this type of kind of semi-realistic painterly look, this step is incredibly important. And it also takes a deceptive amount of time to get right. For this painting in particular, making the armor plate look 3D enough without being so shiny it became the focal point was one of the big challenges. I got around that by making the armor itself quite matte while adding smaller highlights on just the ornaments to imply the form. I also went in everywhere with a soft brush to add occlusion shadows and also a bit of bounce light from the fur on the side of her jaw. Because this is a mostly overcast scene with just a small spotlight from the side, I didn't add any strong cast shadows. There's a small one on her nose and just some more occlusion shadows on her face, like her eye socket, uh, under her lips. But other than that, I was pretty careful with the harsh shadows. With this step, you really need to consider what your light environment is and what the light source is. With this scene, the light source is kind of just the ambience of the world around her. She's standing outside, but it's an overcast, very gray day. There's smoke around her. There's not a lot of light coming through from the sun, meaning everything would take on this kind of diffused quality. And then with the spotlight, I like to have a little bit of whimsy in my paintings. I don't care about keeping everything 100% realistic. So maybe that spotlight is a bit of the sun breaking through the clouds. Maybe it's something else entirely off screen. I'm not really sure. I think it's totally okay to break these rules once you know them. The most important part is just nailing that kind of overall atmosphere and the overall form. And then adding these touches of magic to, to enhance this wherever you want. In the end, I think I could have done a little bit of a better job with this step for this painting. While I don't think it looks flat, I think I definitely struggle with making things look really 3D sometimes. I think it's it's just about bridging that gap between having things be really painterly and textured and not over rendering them but at the same time making sure you do have those occlusion shadows making sure you control your values well enough that all the forms read really well that's still something i'm working on but but that's okay like we're literally all learning so 
not everything I do is going to be perfect all the time and that's fine. Moving on to number two, making sure there's a good level of detail contrast. Meaning that things like her face needs to have some more sharper edges and smaller shapes than something like her hand in the corner of the canvas. If the detail is the same in the entire painting, it might get a bit overly busy and hard to read. There's a variety of different methods you can use for this though. There's value contrast, like how the spotlight of her face is one of the most concentrated highlights in the painting. There's hue contrast, there's saturation contrast, and the list goes on and on. For me, keeping a particular eye on the detail contrast allows me to get that really crisp look without absolutely rendering my paintings to death. I used to do this in the past where I was so scared that something would look unfinished, so I just rendered every single corner of the painting for hours. And it was just a lot of unnecessary work that sometimes just made my paintings a little bit harder to look at than they would have been if I had softened out some of the less important things and just sharpened up the really important stuff. So that's still something I'm trying to get better at, and it was something I was really focusing on with this painting, just allowing things to just be loose. And number three is another big one. Hue variation. Hue variation is arguably one of the most impactful things I do to my paintings. I find that it adds so much life and nuance into any painting, and especially with a very monochromatic palette, it does a lot of work to make the painting come alive. So when I'm implementing hue variation, I don't just grab random colors and kind of start smearing them everywhere. I try to work within the general palette the painting already has. Maybe extending a few degrees outside of the palette on the color wheel, but mainly I'm playing with the level of saturation. I think it's easy to forget, especially if you're more of a beginner with painting, that the saturation of a color can be just as impactful as the hue itself. So here, for example, my painting is based on a primarily blue palette, with a lot of these saturated purples for her skin. And so when I was picking colors to use for these pops of variation, I grabbed vibrant purple and lilac as those were already big parts of the painting, but desaturated. I grabbed some half-saturated pinks. These are playing off the small bits of red string in the painting, which is why they don't look completely out of place. And I also used some saturated blues. I also took advantage of some very desaturated tones in some areas too, using color relativity to my advantage to create the appearance of a more varied palette. If you're not familiar with color relativity, I believe I talked about this a bit in one of my older videos. I have no idea what I was talking about back then, to be honest. Um, it's basically, to explain it really quickly, it's how a color changes its appearance based on the other colors around it. It's like if you have a gigantic red square and you grab some green and you put a dot of the green in the middle, the green isn't gonna look green anymore because the green is surrounded by this sea of very strong red. So the red is gonna alter your perception of the green and the green might appear brown instead. And so for example, with a painting like this, everything is blue, pretty much. Everything has a little bit of blue in it. So if I grabbed a teal and I desaturated it almost all the way to the point where it's just gray, that gray will appear as if it's a warm color, almost like a brown, even though it's actually just a slight variation of desaturated blue. So all of this, the hue variation playing with the hue itself, but also with the saturation, all of this adds a lot of depth to the painting, but it also has the effect of unifying the palette across the painting making for a more holistic impression of the scene. So I could talk about color and how cool it is for literally hours, but I'm gonna move on to number four. So this is the last thing, and it's maybe the most abstract part of the list. It's not so much about art theory and more about just vibes. Um, I try to ask myself pretty much constantly while I'm working on a painting, is this interesting? Is the painting communicating what I want to communicate? And do all the parts work nicely together? I ask myself these things constantly while I'm painting, and this is the reason why I keep going back to her face to make subtle tweaks to her expression. You can see I never like go to one area and just finish it. I'm always jumping around from different parts of the painting, never really staying in one place for too long because I want to make sure that the painting is coming together as a whole and I'm not just developing one corner and losing sight of the big picture. 
So usually with most paintings, it's the face that tends to be the hardest to nail. With this one, I also had to do a lot of work on the sword. I was going for this almost primitive and dark look for the hilt, as it's meant to be carved out of a really tough material. But it ended up just kind of looking a bit pudgy and undefined, so after going back over it again and again and adding another layer of detail on it, it finally started coming together. I also realized over the hours I worked on this painting that I really needed some sort of implied background. I just wanted this to be very atmospheric with some smoke from her forge and some icy fog to be in the background, but it just felt too flat. And so really roughly I sketched in some stone archways in the background, making sure to give them dimension while also making sure they didn't have too much contrast so they would lead your eye away from the character. After mentally going through this checklist again and again for the last 70% of the process, I was almost finished. This painting came together in a bit under 8 hours, and honestly it was some of the most fun painting I have done in a long time. Over the past couple of years, I think I've gotten a bit too hung up on like what I should be doing and what my art should look like to make sure it's not compared to X or Y or Z, and paradoxically the main effect it's had is just making my art more generic. It's like I just put all these weird constraints on myself that no one else was pressuring me into having. I would just always have voices in my head telling me that like I couldn't just do the thing I really wanted to do. I had to do it like this because this is what the cool artists do or like this is what you should be doing. And it just ended up being really silly and really getting in the way of me creating art that I actually enjoy. Uh, let me know if that's something you can relate to because I feel like this is a trap that a lot of us end up getting stuck in. So yeah, from now on, I want to consciously focus more on the joys of creating art and like what I'm really into. Unapologetically just drawing what I want to draw and ignoring that stupid little voice that's telling me what I should be doing. Because at the end of the day, art is supposed to be fun and that's why we all get into it because it's something we're passionate about. So that's what it's going to be all about for the next little while. And on that note, the painting is done. At the end of a painting, I usually finish up any particles or atmosphere that I might want to add, and I see if the piece needs any value or color adjustments. This one didn't, I actually ended up really enjoying the colors I had put into it, so I didn't want to muddle them with any filters. Um, and at the end, I just slap my logo on it and I call it a day. I hope you enjoyed this process video and found something helpful in it, and if you did, subscribe, because I will be trying to make more videos. The keyword is trying. Uh, and you can also hit the little bell to make sure YouTube actually lets you see my videos. Um, I think the algorithm is a bit upset with me for not uploading for nearly two years, so uh, let's try to fix that. But yeah, that's it. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the next one.